kickstarting this third series is actually also a kind of personal anniversary because uh, to my great delight, I was uh, you know, uh, selected to be part of the first lineup of uh, authors uh, for the very first virtual future fiction uh, in March 2017. Um, and the theme at the time was not another loving, it was uh, interrogating the future, which is very serious. Uh, and in response to this theme uh, of the very first virtual future fiction, I uh, decided that it would be a good idea to pick a grand title for my talk, like Transforming uh, Tomorrow with Today's Fiction. Um, but, well, you can forget about the title. Um, what is really relevant is that um, to kickstart this third year of virtual um, uh, near future fiction, well, no, virtual future, near future fiction, whatever. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not wearing my amateur sci-fi uh, writer cap, but I'm really wearing my social scientist cap to talk about the outcomes of two projects that Stephen and I uh, have collaborated on with other people, some of whom are in the room, in the darkness uh, somewhere there. Uh, <laughs> and. Um, over the past two and a half years, uh, and this is important because it was at the same time that uh, Stephen was in parallel developing and uh, running uh, near future fictions. So I will start my, uh, I hope not too academic talk, uh, with a quote by Cheryl Vint, uh, who is a professor in the Department of English at the University of California, Riverside. And there she's doing some influential work uh, at the intersection of science fiction studies and uh, of my own field of uh, social studies of science. Uh, and um, in 2009, in the, in the Routledge Companion of Science Fiction, she wrote um, SF, uh, if at its worst, SF can be the literature of all the worst aspects of science, technocratism, singularity of vision, domination of nature, then at its best, science fiction might be considered the literature of science studies, concerned with the social consequences of development in um, science and technology, um, insisting on dialectical exchange between the novum and the larger social world, sensitive to the contingency of knowledge and open to new ways of being and seeing. I must say I quite share uh, this view uh, and uh, actually I hope that indeed at its best, uh, and I won't try to define best here, um, science fiction is doing um, science, social studies of science like I do by other means. And then that it could have value beyond the literary and entertaining qualities that it can have as a sort of spillover effect uh, in that it could help provoke fertile thinking about uh, this techno-scientific world um, that we humans have created for ourselves uh, and uh, this world that is in turn shaping um, our ourselves and us in, in ways that are often unexpected and unwelcome. So um, this doesn't sound futuristic, but um, yeah, um, I mean, um, it's, I know it's commonly expected of science fiction to talk about the future, but many have argued very convincingly that science fiction has never been truly about the future. Uh, and even situated a long time hence in another galaxy, um, it always speaks to uh, the present uh, when it was really written. And uh, this, in short, was the premise of the, the projects I mentioned earlier uh, that Stephen and, her, and I hatched and directed with the pressure help of other collaborators between 2016 and 2018, and out of which um, uh, came some of Stephen's uh, own fiction over the period. So what uh, the, the projects were about, uh, in a nutshell, uh, they were open-ended, hypothesis generating experiments, so to speak, if I want to be sort of scientific, uh, whereby we took science fiction writers into labs to see what would come out of it. Um, so we enrolled science fiction writers, uh, Stephen among them, uh, to visit scientific labs uh, and to talk to scientists in fields as widely different as uh, robotics. And this was our first project with the Bristol Robotics Labs. 
and um, developmental neurobiology and, epidemiolo and uh, genetic epidemiology. And this was our second project funded by King's Cultural Institute that took us to um, labs that uh, were at King's College London, where our, I'm working. And so for both projects, uh, the author's briefs was quite simple. They each had to produce a, a near future fiction short story inspired by what they had seen researched in the labs uh, and by their interactions with the scientists and engineers. And, you know, taking what they had seen and stretching it just a tiny bit further into the world, sort of Black Mirror style, really. So the stories had to be short, short enough to be read aloud uh, at, as a springboard for discussions uh, at public events we have organized that brought together uh, the writers, scientists from the participating labs, commentators from various horizons, uh, and diverse audiences. Uh, for me, as a, as a researcher in social studies of science, these projects were really the opportunity uh, to pursue some ideas I, I have become uh, interested in, and in particular, questions such as how good can near future fiction be at provoking ethical and social uh, reflection on emerging science and technology? Uh, how good can it be at mediating debates uh, around such topics? Um, and these interrogations, I, um, I must say, are, are part of deeper and larger questions, uh, que questions which so far academic research uh, and practice have fallen frustratingly short uh, of addressing. And for me, this frustration has been part of my motivation for starting uh, to experiment with science fiction, really. So uh, these deeper interrogations are um, at the core of successive waves of social studies of science and technology and uh, in science policy circles as well such as LC, so uh, ethical, legal, social implications of science and technology, uh, such as technology assessment, such as public understanding of science, public engagement with science, more recently responsible research and innovation. Uh, and well, to keep things uh, simple, uh, I, I, I'm going to boil the, all this down to three uh, main questions that I'm interested in and that I'm trying to get to through experimenting with science fiction. So they are, how can we broaden the diversity of views that get to be represented in setting the agenda of research for science and technology? Uh, how can we encourage reflexivity in scientists and engineers? And uh, how can we engage the most diverse kinds of publics uh, into concrete discussions of res collective responsibility um, around science and innovation. So I have absolutely no authoritative answer to offer uh, because I think this is probably a 50-year project at best. But um, and anyway, as, as I said, in terms of research, the projects I've led with, with Stefan were meant to be explorations that would sort of, uh, at best, suggest tentative hypotheses to pursue and uh, alleys of investigations for you know, further projects. Um, that, luckily, they have done. Uh, and so I'm going to share a few pointers with you of things that came out um, from um, these projects. So first, uh, about the public we attracted. Uh, a constant throughout the projects, the two projects, was that the public events we organized were oversubscribed and received very positive evaluation from both audience and participant, which was really nice. Um, and our audiences were not predominantly uh, academic, which was something we were sort of uh, a bit afraid of when we started. Uh, apparently, they exuded a feeling of energy. Uh, uh, they were no legible, and they surprised the scientists by the depth and the breadth of their questions. And a consistent, a consistent and important message that came out of all this is that there is a public out there uh, hungry for forums that, like the one we were providing, uh, a bit like philosophical cafes, uh, where they can have non-polarized discussions and explore, I would say, complex shades of ethical gray uh, surrounding science and technology 
as opposed to the kind of purposefully orchestrated black and white debates that are so often taken to be the norm of what the public wants uh, and of what makes good audience scores. Um, then uh, some pointers about the writers who took part in the projects. One thing that came out strong is the jarring contrast between the idealized and hyped visions uh, of science that can filter through science communication and through um, the media and in the media. And um, this contrasting with uh, actually what the writers saw uh, was the reality of scientists' working practices, which were uh, turned out to be much more messy, mundane, low-tech, repetitive than they had expected, and not to mention uh, burden with all manners of managerial, bureaucratic, and financial concerns. So uh, this much closer to the bone um, perception of scientific work and of the human behind the science uh, was clearly visible in several of the stories with the authors weaving into their plots uh, questions of research ethics, uh, of uh, double binds, of professional misconducts. Uh, and so, for me, uh, the, the takeaway uh, lesson was that taking the authors into the labs and in conversation with scientists uh, not only helped them making, uh, make, make, make the science in their story more accurate and plausible, it also helped to open up scientific practices and processes to make visible things that are uh, normally not visible. Uh, another thing that came out strong on the author's side from the interviews uh, run afterwards uh, is a realization that for those who hadn't got there yet, uh, um, as authors, they may indeed choose to play a role through their science fiction writing in bringing about debates about science, technology, and the future we would like to live in. Uh, that it may be time for soft social science fiction to get closer to the science again and not to leave it open to hard science fiction to unreflexively sing the praises of science and technology without being challenged. Uh, and this, in my view, may be read uh, as an activist position responding to a recently renewed trend in hard science fiction uh, to be uh, utopic and agiographic uh, about science and technology. Um, and this was exemplified a few years ago by the hieroglyph project uh, led by um, famous author Neil Stephenson in collaboration with Arizona State University, uh, which outcome was a near future fiction anthology aimed at reigniting the iconic and optimistic visions of the golden age of science fiction. So um, then finally, uh, I will offer a couple of pointers about uh, the, the adventurous scientists and engineers that opened their labs for us, because it's probably scary to get a bunch of social scientists and writers to barge into your labs. Um, from the perspective of encouraging their ethical, ethical and social reflexivity, uh, the results are a case of glass half full and half empty. Um, because not so surprisingly, um, those who accepted and were you know, eager to collaborate with us, they basically belonged to the already uh, reflexive fringe. Uh, and the immediate reaction is, uh, then what's the point? Because the ones you really want to get to, get, you know, uh, in co to engage with are, are the less reflexive and less aware ones among the scientists and the engineers. So I've really given this some thoughts. Um, and I've sort of come to the conclusion that reaching out to the more ethically aware fringe of uh, the scientific and engineering population could prove to be an effective, although indirect, um, strategy in the long run. Um, because the more insular scientists, uh, they usually do not take it too well uh, to have non-scientists like me or like Stephen come into their labs and tell them that they don't know best and that uh, they should think more about uh, you know, the kind of wider social and ethical implications of the kind of work they do. Why they may accept this better coming from a respecting member of their respective communities. 
Um, so I, I'm now saying that why not think about uh, you know uh, the the reflexive fringe in the scientific uh, population, those who enjoy the kind of engagement we have offered through our projects, as relays for trying to um, you know reach out into the, the isolated corners and those the insular corners of their respective fields. Um, and this idea has become more attractive uh, to me after I found out that even the most ethically engaged scientists and seasoned public engagement actors could discover new ways of thinking uh, thanks to their encounter with near future fiction. And a most rewarding mom moment uh, in the projects for me was when one of the scientists, uh, such, su such, a senior sci uh, such a scientist who's a very senior and respected scientist, uh, told me in an interview that although he had always been an avid science fiction reader, inspired and influenced by it in his career, this has been mostly, uh, you know, far future hard sci-fi he had been into. But his collaboration with us had got him interested into near future fiction, uh, which he was reading a lot more since. And he now thought that the best of it was especially good for bringing out deep sociological perspectives and thinking about the human impact of science and technology. And he added it had also triggered the realization that what they are doing in his lab was turning fiction into facts, was realizing what had hitherto been only imagined. And for him, as a scientist, there is a responsibility in the choice of which imagined future you try to help turn into fact. So for me, that was kind of blissful moments of like, yeah, <laughs> even this scientist who's really uh, already very ethically reflexive uh, is telling me that uh, we have done something through which he's learned something and started thinking in new ways. So uh, I'm going to stop now. Um, I will leave the floor to the storytelling. Um, but before I do that, I will urge you uh, while you listen to these all delightful uh, pieces you are going to listen to, uh, and as Stephen said, you have to concentrate, try to keep at the back of your mind uh, Cheryl Vinn's proposition that I just have been defending about the capacity of science fiction to be the literature of science studies, you know, uh, concerned with the social consequences of developments in science and technology, insisting on dialectical exchanges uh, between the novum and the larger social worlds, sensitive to the contingency of knowledge and open to new ways of seeing and thinking. It may help you, help you really see, you know, hidden and dead serious deaths uh, behind the entertaining stories you're going to listen to. And so, um, just let me say, enjoy what follows.